it was through the fire service that I first came to customer experience. And very briefly, my introduction to it was asking a question after 20 years of being in the service of why the public weren't doing as we told them to. Their behaviour was different to what we expected. And it seemed a quite simple problem that we'd understand why, and then we'd educate them to do the right thing. And I was fascinated by that question because I'd only ever understood my job on a technical and scientific basis. And we spoke to 10 people that had small fires, small injuries. And by the third interview, where we'd said to them, just tell us your story, your words, it completely changed my understanding of what my job could be rather than what I've been trained to do. And there's a fundamental difference between us understanding the event and the people understanding the impact. And when I went back to the board two years later with our results, I said, I've not heard a single person who was stupid, incapable or irrational. When you know their circumstances and context, their actions make perfect sense. We've got to do some deep thinking about what we're here for, because I don't think we get it anymore. <clears throat> and so my introduction was that, and I was fortunate to be the first customer experience manager introducing the methodologies into the fire service, because one of the things I recognised was that companies already had that understanding of customers. We didn't need to invent it. It wasn't unique to us. We just needed to borrow from the best in the other sector. And so I sat between those two sectors. And when I left the service, I wanted to continue that because there are things that each can learn from the other. And I like intersections. So I still take, I still work in the international crisis and disaster space as an advisor and take from customer experience, some of the things about service design, customer journey planning, and those invaluable tools and mindset that can help us do better for people when they need it most. And perhaps coming back the other way, and I'll touch on it in a minute, is that in the risk and crisis space, we're very good at dealing with uncertainty. It's a fact of how we have to manage. And perhaps in some of the businesses and organizations, there's less comfort with that. So in this presentation, I'm going to just briefly touch on a few things about, in moments of crisis, how you can prepare your organization, but also think about on a human level and hopefully go beyond just coping. And that's a really key distinction that we're trying to push through at the moment. There are positive impacts around crises and disasters that can be very beneficial at the time in the longer term, if we recognize that rather than just going into a mentality of survival. But it's perhaps something we're still less comfortable talking about. So I'm going to briefly touch on a few organizational principles and human factors. Inevitably, because they are those principles, they will vary in how they are applied to different organizations. And so I'm not going to get too detailed, but just to share some things that we've come through. And actually, the pandemic has been a rare example where perhaps the organizations and their customers and the wider society have experienced the same thing at the same time. So sometimes the organization will be in crisis and have to maintain its service to customer base that's unaffected. And other times it will be an organization that's functioning normally, but seeing its customers perhaps go through some disturbance in their life. I just briefly want to touch on a really important distinction because this sets the tone. How we define crises. It's one of those terms that we use frequently. And the danger with the terms we use frequently is that we don't always have the same understanding. And actually, at this point, it's critical. So just if we go through, I suppose, the hierarchy, most people be very well aware of risk and how they interpret risk, the potential to do harm. <clears throat> Excuse me. A good example of, I think, a, a, a definition for that is the Sendai framework that includes the sentiment of vulnerability. It's just not the immediate event. It's how it makes you personally vulnerable to further events and secondary consequences. And I think that's a really important distinction. We have emergencies and emergencies tend to be things that disrupt our daily life. We, we weren't perhaps expecting them, but within our organizational or personal capacity, we can deal with them. It may change things for that day. We may have to reorganize, we have to do something differently, but generally within our context, we can do something about it. When we get to a crisis, this is perhaps for me the, the most important point. A crisis is, there's a realization that something significant is underway or going to happen but you have a choice about how you respond to it and your actions will have a significant impact on the result that's achieved by the time we get to a disaster you are generally responding to events that are beyond your control so within that framework a crisis for an organization or a crisis for an individual or a community is a very key point and it's one of those terms that if you're going to use that amongst friends colleagues or an organizational strategy, 
make sure we've got clarity on that terminology because it sets the tone in such an important way. And I, I liked, Santa, you mentioned very well earlier about that clarity of setting out when you started the CX, the Customer Experience World Games. Our team, we intend to win. <clears throat> and it is sometimes as simple as that, creating an unambiguous statement about what we're going to do. And I think, as I say, one of the things that we're seeing in the crisis disaster space is the emerging idea that it's not all about the negative consequences, and that's not to undermine them in any way. But when we go into crises, either in individual or organizational, we are going to be tested. Those tests can make us stronger for the next time around. They will push us into places we'd never thought of going or we wouldn't normally go. And we can learn from that. We can enhance our personal resilience, organizational resilience. So actually for the long-term benefit, we shouldn't go into crises with a view that if we get through, that's good. This, I think the more intelligent companies and the ones that want to be here for a longer time will recognize whilst it's forced change, you may not be able to do anything about the circumstances that created it. You do have a choice about how you approach it and how you come out the other side and what you've learned from it. And that's a really important distinction around how we start to imagine that. And it, in the pandemic, I think we've seen some very good examples of companies that have had that positive mindset They've accepted what's happening is happening, but they've decided to take a major part in it. And I think, again, the Customer Experience World Games is, is in some ways, realizes that, that there was these events going on and Christopher and the team thought, we don't just have to sit and bear witness. We can make a difference. We can make a contribution. We've got some capacity. We can't do the things we normally do, but let's bring that in and use it positively. One of the key things, I guess, with crises is it, it heightens a level of uncertainty. And I, and I mentioned this earlier. When in normal times, businesses tend to dislike uncertainty. We can't predict tomorrow, but we can make a reasonable assumption that we can look backwards and, and pick up some historical trends. We can do a little bit of assessment around what we expect to happen and plan for that because we have to have some sort of plan. But the crisis introduced heightened uncertainty and in, in areas that maybe that we hadn't necessarily thought about. Some of those we can manage. We may be able to talk to suppliers and see and get a really good assessment. But in terms of areas like customer behavior or employee behavior, it's more difficult. And those are the ones we've got to be very sensible and very attuned to looking at and seeing what's happening, not always what we would like to happen. And I'd, I'd go, there is a danger that sometimes we create an illusion of certainty because we can produce so much data, we can produce so many charts, and we think, well, that's going to happen. In crisis mode, one of the things that's helpful is scenario testing. So rather than setting out a distinct path, we say we think these may be options. There may be five or six scenarios we can imagine. And then be very good at seeing on a regular basis, does it look like more like we're going one way than the other and adjust. But what I'd say about scenario testing, for those that are starting to hear more about it, is be wary of the trap of saying, well done, we passed the test because we got the right result. What you need to test is your organizational capability. When things change, when you've got greater uncertainty, how did you make those decisions? You may have got the decision wrong in terms of it didn't get the result you wanted on that test. But if you can look at the way you made that decision and say, fundamentally, it's sound. We did the right thing. You're in a good place. And that may mean adjusting. So, for example, there are all sorts of biases which you'll be aware of in decision making. And your normal process may not be the best. So it can be good to think about a facilitator, somebody that can come in that can actually suggest, is this the best way to make this decision? Or actually I'm sensing that we aren't hearing all the voices in the room, some independence and the voice of customer. And I guess within that, what does good look like? It's going to be different to what you normally do. And so you have that choice, particularly at the crisis stage, to determine where you want to come out as an organization within the things you can control. And I think many good organizations have that very good clarity around understanding what they can control and what they can't and focus on the former. It's a dangerous trap to get into. If only this would happen, then we could do something else. Because if that never happens, you haven't made any progress. So focus on those areas you can control, have an idea and be mindful of if something changes, we can respond to that, but don't necessarily rely on it. And I think, as I say, when we recognize 
events and its learning opportunities, they become very powerful for resilience. Another thing that we've seen is the emergence of spontaneous volunteers, and that's formed part of the customer experience world games. That people now are connected in such a way at individual level through mobile phones, through the internet, that it allows people that can be far removed from an event to believe they can help and do something positive. And again, that in many ways, that's the essence of the customer experience games. We have a global community of different skills that people can apply to problems either at a very local level or more widely. Now that reference is an opportunity for companies. And what we've, what I'm seeing in all honesty in some of the, the crisis sector is some people are quite fearful of that because they're not part of that normal fabric. They're not necessarily known. We have to be cautious and we have to understand who's bringing value and who's there for the right reason. But the reality is they offer new partnerships because many of the people that have come in have got incredible networks, they've got incredible talent and ideas. And again, as Christopher alluded to, the customer experience community is that, but it's very difficult for us to engage with an established sector of the crisis and disaster world because they're fearful, because they're under capacity, uh, they've got lots of capacity issues. And actually often the funding is already predetermined. It doesn't allow them to do those different things. So there's some structural elements that we want to take back to NGOs, to funders, to researchers to say, we're missing valuable innovation and partnership opportunities because we're too rigid in our structure. That applies equally as much to brands and to an extent to us personally. We resist things that we're not comfortable with and in doing so we can lose opportunities to help us through times of great need. When I'm just going to touch briefly on management and again there's quite often a distinction that from our emergency experience we used to have to give clearly defined tasks and trust people to do them. If in a crisis you start to micromanage and be prescriptive, it rarely loses where it ends because you, you appear to gain more control, but what you lose is the willingness of the person to engage. And I think, again, Chris has made this point about what is our role in helping? Do we say, we've got a great idea, this is what you should do? Or do we help people develop their own needs, thoughts, and enable that? And I think that's absolutely the way to go because one of the things about helping is we may feel very spurred on to do something now but will we still be there in a year two years three years or will we've gone on to something else and i think ownership of where it needs to be is the person in great self and what we can do to enable that is the most powerful thing and so christopher has, has touched on this already but it's also for a very human reason one of the most powerful things that we tend to lose sight of is the ability to make choices for ourselves and when we did the refugee challenge that's one of the things we tried to convey so imagine if you can that whatever life you're living today all the things you have around you tomorrow morning you wake up with the realization that you've got to leave home you have to decide what you're going to take where you're going to go where you're going to get information who you trust and it's a very very human experience and it's also disempowering. And the minute we start to give people labels, we can make that even worse. So if we take somebody who is a member of a family, has a professional job, has a community around them, and the next day we call them a refugee, that comes preloaded with a set of expectations that are generally lower than they had the day before. And that is very dangerous. And I think for customer experience, I've been looking very much at human. What do we mean by human experience? Because that's another term we've seen a lot of. It's poorly defined and I think when we start to speak about customers or refugees often we restrict our understanding of that person and their needs and lower the expectations for them so the language becomes very important around some of these areas and if we can do anything and I think it's a great opportunity for customer experience world is to recognize at a human level what that experience is like what it could be like and what's important to them and I'll go back to the point I mentioned earlier about it's not just the need, it's actually the, the impact that that may have in the longer term, because people recognize these are temporary interruptions often to their lives. So I think when we talk about a, a human experience, it is about a lot of the aid agencies and the NGOs are very good and they're essential to what we do, but they can often get caught in processing. And one of the mindsets I would suggest we need to bring in is to recognize that you can't personalize 
some crises. But what you can predict is that within a group of 100 people, there will be a distribution curve. There may be 60 in the middle that have average needs and we're fairly predictable, but either side of that, there will be specific requirements. And we may not know which individual has those, but generally we should start to appreciate that those will be present in a group and we should design to that. And I think that's one of the areas where customer experience has so much to offer, both in terms of innovation and helping organizations avoid the silo effect of getting some of the part experiences and outcomes rather than building around a refugee or customer journey. So there are many areas where I think, I say the, the customer experience world games, it was an absolute joy to see it come to fruition because it, it very much reinforces my view that those two sectors have got a lot to learn from each other. And I guess if I give an example around one of the things that's so important, we tend to live in a, a world that's dominated by projects and efficiency. One of the most powerful things you can build organizationally or at community level is relationships, taking the time to, without agenda, get to know people. And for those that remember the Boston bombings, it was deemed to be a very good response from the emergency services. The reason it was deemed to be that when they looked at what were the factors that, that allowed that, <clears throat> the most critical one that they identified was the fact that all of the senior officers knew each other. So when they went into that room, there was no egos and there's no hierarchies. There was none of the, I've got these resources, but I can't use them for that. It was a group of people who knew each other, trusted each other, defined the problem comment in, to an, in a common way and used all their resources to do what was needed. And I think, as I say, in a world where, particularly as we get austerity to come back through, the, the likelihood is we will see more people operationalize efficiency. I think at exactly that moment, experience, whether you're in a supermarket, whether you're looking to help people in less fortunate circumstances, experience is going to get squeezed. And yet I think it probably in five years time, we will recognize it as the biggest differential and value add that we had. And, it, and when we look at the pandemic, it was interesting to me that we had this massive digitalized pro, digitalization program, which I, I fully appreciate the benefit of that and the necessity for it. And yet as humans, the thing that everyone's now saying is it's great to get back in person. And I think we, we need to reconcile both of those and see technology doing where it is good, but all of these experiences come and start from a human perspective. I think I've covered most of what Brilliant. I wanted to, but I just think I would just sort of end. We will get more crises coming through. It's going to be a fact of life. We live in a very uncertain world. For longevity, companies can gear up not only to put themselves in a good position, but to do good for others in that whilst they're going through that. It's, it's, it's as much a strategic choice as it is anything else. And I think I say we can, we should raise aspirations, not lower them um, through these times. And we certainly have the tools and the talent to do that.